Lucy, arguably the most famous member of a hominin species called Australopithecus afarensis. Australopithecus afarensis lived between 3.8 and 3 million years ago in a variety of regions throughout Africa. Research over the past 60 years has given us clues about how Australopithecus afarensis lived, how it walked and what it ate. But what do we actually know about the brain of Australopithecus afarensis? The earliest fossils of Australopithecus afarensis were found in the 1930s, but they only received that species name in the late 1970s, after a number of very important findings. In that time, the team of Mary Leakey unearthed several fossil findings in Laetuli, Tanzania. And in the same time, the team of Donald Johansson found even more stunning remains in the Hadar region of Ethiopia. In these latter findings, there was also a group of fossils that was labeled AL288-1, which is better known as Lucy. To date, we have over 400 specimens, of which half a dozen or so skulls or partial skulls can be reconstructed. This has given researchers the opportunity to make endocasts. An endocast is a reconstruction of the cranial vault where the brain once was. Such artificial endocasts give us a proxy of what the brain looked like and help us to investigate brain size, shape and sometimes even specific morphological features. We have to rely on artificial endocasts because soft tissue, like the brain, almost never fossilizes. However, in the year 2000, a stunning fossil was found in the Dikika region of Ethiopia. The skull of a two and a half year old child was found and the cranial cavity was filled with fine-grained sandstone, creating a natural endocast that contains surprising detail on several morphological features of the brain. The skull, which indeed was categorized as an Australopithecus afarensis, has the official label DIK11, and it is better known as Salam, but is also often referred to as the Dikika child. Now that we know which specimen we have to investigate Australopithecus afarensis' brain, Let's first take a look at its brain size. With a mean brain size of 450 cubic centimeters, an adult Australopithecus afarensis brain was on average 15 to 20 percent larger than that of Sahelanthropus chadensis and of modern chimpanzees. Also, it was about 30 to 40 percent larger than the brain of the earlier living Ardipithecus ramidus. However, cranial volume ranges between 380 and 520 cubic centimeters, so that means there is a considerable variability. This large range can be partially explained by sexual dimorphism. Indeed, height differed significantly between male and female Australopithecus afarensis. And since brain size is correlated with height, male afarensis tended to have larger brains. Now, the increase in brain volume seems to be mostly driven by changes in the neocortex. However, the cerebellum on the other hand is rather small in comparison to other Australopithecines and modern chimpanzees. Interestingly, the feature of a rather small cerebellum afarensis shares with other robust Australopithecines also known as Paranthropus. Now, the cerebellum is a complex structure with a lot of small folds, and unfortunately this information is missing in the endocasts that we have. So, which functional consequences a small cerebellum would have had, we don't know. A much more clear understanding we have of the occipital cortex of Australopithecus afarensis. And for this knowledge we have to thank the amazing Dikika child fossil as well as recent fascinating research by the team of Professor Philip Guns. Their research focused on the position of the so-called lunate sulcus in the Dikika child. The lunate sulcus is a clearly visible ridge in modern apes that marks the border between occipital and parietal cortex. This is such a clear landmark in the ape brain that the German word for the lunate sulcus is actually Affenspalte, which literally translates to ape fissure. Now interestingly, in modern humans, the lunate sulcus is often not clearly identifiable. And in the rare cases that it is, it is placed much more backwards in the occipital cortex. So if we know where the lunate sulcus was in Australopithecus afarensis, we know how much the back of the brain changed in early hominin evolution. 
So where is the lunate sulcus in the Dikika child? Now interestingly, it is almost at the same place as it is in modern chimpanzees. And this was not only found in the Dikika child, but was also confirmed in several other Australopithecus afarensis endocasts. So the conclusion is rather simple. In the time since the evolutionary divergence from modern chimpanzees, the occipital cortex of Australopithecus afarensis most likely did not change drastically in structure. Whereas the back of the brain did not change very much, the front of the brain might have undergone more changes. In a study by Heidel Selassie and colleagues, it was shown that the post-orbital region was enlarged. The post-orbital region reflects the width of the skull behind the eyes, and as a consequence, a broader post-orbital region suggests an increase in prefrontal cortex size. So there is a possibility that the prefrontal cortex was larger in Australopithecus afarensis. And this makes sense if we compare it to later Australopithecines, like Australopithecus africanus, who shows the same feature. And it is not observed in earlier living hominins, like Ardipithecus and Sahelanthropus. Of course, a big prefrontal cortex would later become the hallmark of the Homo species. So Australopithecus afarensis may have been the first species that experienced an increase in prefrontal regions. Now, the prefrontal cortex is related to cognition, reasoning and mental abilities. So can we conclude that Australopithecus afarensis made a leap in intelligence? Well, as with a lot of things in this field, this is rather speculative, because we simply have little idea how intelligent the species was and how it actually behaved. One of the very few behavioral aspects that relate to intelligence is the ability to use and make stone tools. And although it is debated, it is unlikely that Australopithecus afarensis was a profound toolmaker. So how much more intelligent Australopithecus afarensis was, compared to other species, is hard to say. Nevertheless, our beloved Dikika child gives us some more clues that cognitive capacity of Australopithecus afarensis indeed may have changed, compared to earlier species. We do know that the Dikika child was about 2 years and 5 months old when it deceased. We can get these exact figures from dental records. By using high resolution scans, we can observe growth lines in our teeth, just like rings of a tree. But rather than every year, they happen every day. So the exact age can be determined based on the number of growth lines in the teeth. So now that we know how old the Dikika child was, let's go back to the brain. If we compare the brain size of the approximately two and a half year old Dikika child to a chimpanzee child that is of the same age, we do see that the Dikika child has a rather small brain. And the same observation was made for the brain of another Australopithecus afarensis child who is labeled as AL333105. So at two and a half years old, Australopithecus afarensis seems to have had a smaller brain than a two and a half year old modern chimpanzee. This is interesting because we know that the adult afarensis had larger brains than an average modern chimpanzee. This suggests that early brain development took longer. And indeed, the time it takes for the brain to mature is strongly related to cognitive abilities, as well as learning at a young age. During the course of human evolution, we see that brain development becomes longer and longer. And in Homo sapiens, the brain is not fully matured until the approximate age of 20 years. So the observation of longer brain maturation in Australopithecus afarensis suggests an increased need for learning at a young age and thus an overall higher cognitive capacity. In summary, what do we know about the brain of Australopithecus afarensis? Well, its brain size was slightly larger compared to hominins that lived before. Furthermore, this increase in brain size was primarily observed in the neocortex and in particular the frontal regions of the brain. And despite a potential increase in prefrontal areas, the visual cortex looked similar to that of modern chimpanzees. So what does this mean for the bigger picture? Basically, the time between 4 and 2 million years ago was an experimental phase, wherein different species various brain adaptations occurred and the successful ones survived. 
As such, the brain of Australopithecus afarensis reflects a potpourri of morphological features that is consistent with different other lineages that lived earlier or later. Now, that's all for Australopithecus afarensis brain. If you think this video was interesting, check out our analyses of the brains of Ardipithecus and Sahelanthropus chadensis. And as always, we hope to see you the next time.